This is American History TV's Lectures in History podcast. This week, a class on alcohol use in the early American Republic and how it spawned the temperance movement in the 1830s, taught by University of California Davis professor Alan Taylor. This episode was recorded in 2014. Okay. Now, we've been talking in this class about the American Republic, which is a radical experiment for its time. There were very few republics in the world. And so this is a risky venture because it expects a lot of people. In a monarchy, the duty of the people is essentially to obey. But in a republic, the citizens must participate. They need to vote. They should follow issues. They should be involved in campaigns. And so a republic asks much more of people. And this is the foundational generation for this American Republic. And yet this is also the peak period for alcoholic consumption in America. So there is this paradox in that this is a period where the political thinking, the political ideology, said that we need an electorate with virtue. In other words, an electorate where the people are committed to the well-being, to the common good of the country, and should be willing to set aside their self-interest to advance that common good. That's the concept of virtue. And yet this is a period when people are also drinking as never before. And you can see the statistics here that historians have come up with. That in 1790, the per capita alcohol consumption in the United States, in the equivalent of gallons of 90 proof alcohol. Now what does 90 proof mean? Everybody knows the answer to that. <laughs> I ask you about Alexander Hamilton's fiscal policy, and there are crickets in here. But I ask what 90 proof is, and half the class knows the answer to that. 45% alcohol. So, per capita, that's also a term. What does per capita mean? Yeah? Per person. Okay, so in the U.S. population, if we say per capita, that includes women and children, including newborn infants. So we're taking the whole quantity of alcohol apparently consumed in 1790 and dividing it by the total population, and we get 3.5 gallons per person. Now, I think we can conclude that men were drinking most of this. We're drinking more than the infants. And we're probably drinking much more than the women were. So we can assume that men's consumption was probably on the order of 16 gallons per year of the equivalent of 90 proof alcohol. Now that is higher than it was previously during the colonial era. And yet it will go up. You see by 1830 it's up to 4 gallons per capita in U.S. So this is a period of peak consumption of alcohol in American history. Now you're wondering how you measure up. Well the last statistics that I have is for the year 2007 and it shows that alcohol consumption in this country is half of what it used to be. And yet there's plenty of evidence that alcohol can be for much of the American population still a problem. Okay, so we've talked about the extent of drinking. We need to talk about what it was that early Americans were drinking. So here are the options. You have to think about what were gentlemen drinking and what were common people drinking. Of these options up here, what did gentlemen of the early republic prefer? Gentlemen like John Marshall. Madeira, which is that strong wine, imported wine. Pretty expensive, has a punch, but not nearly as powerful as what common people preferred. Of the options there, what did common people prefer? And you're thinking beer because you're thinking in your own time. 
right? What do you think of those choices would be the most popular for common men in America of 1830? Whiskey. Whiskey, far and away. Remember we talked about the whiskey rebellion, how people were upset about the federal government putting a tax on whiskey? Because that really hit home. That was a preferred item of consumption. Now, it's a good question. Why did they drink so much whiskey and very little beer? Well, a lot of it has to do with technology. Go ahead. Um, does whiskey also keep them like, warm? It has a warming effect, more so than beer, and that's important because lots of people are working outdoors. Yes? Uh, unlike beer, whiskey won't spoil as easily? It doesn't spoil as easily. Now, there is no refrigeration in the early republic. So you can't go to your refrigerator and get a nice cold beer. If you're going to drink a beer, it's got to be freshly made, and you've got to drink it pretty quickly before it goes bad. Now, people are moving around a lot, so they like something that's portable, something they can put in a flask and stick in their pocket. And whiskey's perfect for that, and it will keep for a very long time. So people drank a lot of whiskey and very little beer. And wine, they mostly drank these very strong wines like Madeira, but wine drinking was a phenomena of gentlemen rather than of common people. So foreigners commented on the very great extent of drinking in the early republic. One English visitor said that Americans were, quote, certainly not as sober as the French or Germans, but perhaps about on a level with the Irish. And Americans recognized their own heavy drinking. John Adams found it, quote, mortifying that we Americans should exceed all other people in the world in this degrading, beastly vice of intemperance, end quote. Now, intemperance meant drunkenness in the language of the time. George Washington thought that alcohol was, quote, the reign of half the workmen in this country, end quote. But it's not just workmen, it's also gentlemen. For example, in 1790, the governor of New York gave a public dinner, attended by fellow gentlemen. There were 120 gentlemen attending, and they consumed 135 bottles of Madeira, 36 bottles of port, 60 bottles of beer, and these would be bottles the same size as a wine bottle. So the running total for those of you keeping score, 135 bottles of Madeira, 36 of port, 60 of beer, and 15 bottles of rum, and this was at one public dinner. Now partly the drinking is so heavy at these political banquets because they are offering toasts to almost everything. There would be a toast to the United States a toast to the Constitution, a toast to the heroes of the Revolution, a toast to the President, a toast to the Vice President, a toast to the American Fair, by which they meant the women who were not attending the banquet. There would also be a toast, often, for every single state in the Union. <laughs> now, that's uh, quite a challenge when you're just at 13 states, but they keep adding states to the Union. Indeed, I think this is one of their prime incentives for adding states to the Union. <laughs> Let's let in Kentucky. That'll be another toast at the next banquet. And people are drinking everywhere and on all occasions. They drank at home and they drank at work. They drank at taverns. They drank at play. They drank for pleasure and they drank to numb pain. They drank from the crack of dawn to the crack of dawn. It was standard for many men to begin the day with what was called an eye opener, which was a shot of whiskey, and then to continue through the rest of the day. A traveler declared, quote, Americans can do nothing without a drink. If you make acquaintance, you drink. If you close a bargain, you drink. They quarrel in their drink and they make it up with a drink. They drink because it is hot. They drink because it is cold. 
If successful in elections, they drink and rejoice. If not, they drink and swear." End quote. So now we've got a pattern. So we've got something that we need to explain. We have to address the why question. Why is it that Americans are drinking so much in this period of American history? What explanations would you want to put on the table for this? Yes? Maybe the water quality wasn't so good? Water quality? Poor water quality, and that's certainly true. There was almost nothing in the way of public purified water, which we take for granted today. How did you get your water in the early republic? You went to the well and got it, even in the cities. And in the cities, you can imagine just how filthy the well water would get or if you're drawing water out of a river or out of a stream because they also double as sewers. So drinking the water was not a popular option. What else would you put for an explanation? Yes? Um, is it because the cost of alcohol during that time is not very expensive? To say the least, it's very cheap. It's the cheapest in all the world. Now why do you suppose alcohol would be so cheap in the United States? Yes? or importing is a lot cheaper. Okay, do you think they're mostly importing their alcohol or consuming domestically produced alcohol? Mostly. Because Madeira is imported, but what about whiskey? Okay, what's whiskey made from? Grain. And what do Americans grow a ton of? Grain. They're the number one grain producing country in the world. It's an agricultural country. They've got a lot of surplus grain. And often the grain growers are at a distance from market. Say they're in western Pennsylvania. And they've got to get their produce over the mountains to market in Philadelphia. You want something that's more portable and higher value per volume. And so distilling your corn crop into whiskey makes it much more marketable in the east. So there is more whiskey being produced in the United States than in any other country in the world. And when you've got a big supply, it means the price is going to be low. Another factor is that governments didn't tax whiskey. You remember what happened when the federal government tried to tax whiskey? It didn't go well. Now, if any of you want to rush out and buy a bottle of whiskey right after this lecture, you're going to find it's pretty expensive. And you're going to find that most of the cost of that whiskey comes in the form of federal and state taxes. So in the 20th century, governments got in the habit of levying taxes on whiskey and got away with it. But that wasn't the case in the early 19th century. So you had a very common product with virtually no taxation on it. And that meant it was cheap. And it was cheaper to get drunk in America than in any other country in the world. And many Americans thought that was their primary liberty. So we have bad water. What about drinking other things? What about drinking soda or drinking juices? Were those options? Soda did not exist, and I'm pretty no sure carbonation. juices were rare. And fruit juices, again, you've got the refrigeration problem. So people might drink some juice right away during harvest season, but there's no way to store it except to turn it into alcohol. So you would turn apple juice into a hard cider, or you would turn uh, pear juice into a pear brandy. But there's very little to drink in America that's not alcoholic other than water, and the water was bad. When they asked one New Yorker what he thought about the local water, he said, quote, it's very good for navigation. In other words, you can sail on it, but you don't want to drink it. Okay, so we have the bad water. We have the fact that whiskey is quite cheap. Any other explanations that you could think of for why people drink so much in this period of time? Yes? Being drunk makes you feel better about whatever's happening in your life? Certainly it does. Okay, in the short term. 
So there are stresses in this society. It's a very competitive society in terms of people seeking to make money. And not everybody is going to succeed. There will be a fair share of failures. And so just the stress of this more competitive society is going to lead a lot of people to drink to console themselves or to drink to celebrate that they're successful. Any other things that you can think of? Yes? Uh, going back to the domestic <coughs> production, the cost of transportation between uh, out west uh, farms and cities of the east was a lot cheaper. Okay, transportation costs are going down as transportation is being improved, particularly in this period of time with the steamboat, but also early canals such as the Erie Canal, which is completed in 1825. So that's helping to lower the cost of whiskey in the East when that whiskey is being brought from the West. Now let me also suggest to you that the high geographic mobility of Americans contributes to this. That Americans are moving around in pursuit of economic opportunity, not always finding it. And when they do move around, they are trying to form new social bonds with people and they often found it easier to share a drink with some new acquaintance to try to get to know them and so almost every social occasion featured drinking every corn husking barn raising funeral marriage birth called for alcohol one farmer remembered a country funeral in Maine. Quote, the minister could not stand to preach without holding on by the side of the door. The bearers could not walk straight or the mourners keep in line of procession. Yet it was not noticed in those times. End quote. Now the same man recalled a local wedding. Quote, we all took so freely of the good cheer that the minister forgot his verses so after trying several kinds of poetry and ditties, he gave it up and said to the couple, you may consider yourselves married and I will come out some other day and finish the ceremony. <laughs> now these were stories that were told during the 1830s looking back on this earlier time, a very heavy drinking. Now another factor is what Americans ate. What do you suppose the diet was very heavy on in this period of time? A lot of health food? No. What do you suppose people ate massive quantities of? Meat. Now, we come to the refrigeration issue. Could you go to the ref refrigerator and pull out a steak? No. Were there any grocery stores to go to? No. So, how did you preserve meat at that time? You salt it or you smoke it. In either case, if you eat a lot of that, you're going to be very thirsty. And then you're going to pace the choice, water or whiskey. And most Americans will choose the whiskey. There was the belief that after you've had a heavy meal, heavy and salted or smoked meat, that you need alcohol to settle your stomach. Now, Americans were notorious for eating massive quantities of food and eating it as quickly as possible. European visitors were just astonished. They would bring stopwatches to time American meals. And they would just marvel to see these huge quantities of hams and beefsteak and bacon being bolted down in five minutes. And then they, of course, they have to settle their stomachs and it's with whiskey. One visitor noted, quote, as soon as food is set on the table, they fall upon it like wolves on an unguarded herd. Yes? Um, don't they get a lot of, like, alcohol poisoning? Or We're going to come to problems. I promise that. We're going to come down to those because none of this is going to be without problems. And we're going to talk about social consequences. But in terms of causes, I also want to talk about the nature of work. There was the belief 
that alcohol helped people work outdoors. It helped them deal with extremes of temperature, either very hot or very cold. Helped them cope with it raining or snowing. Now, did most Americans work outdoors or indoors at that time? Outdoors. outdoors, because what sorts of jobs did they have? They're farmers, overwhelmingly. That's the number one occupation in America, 80%. And then other common occupations were also outdoors, being a sailor, being a logger, being a fisherman, being a dock worker. Relatively few Americans worked indoors at desk jobs. And so if you believe that this helps you cope with the weather outside, you're going to be drinking on the job. And even people who worked in shops, let's say as blacksmiths or shoemakers, they also drank during the job. And the belief was that it helped people do their daily work. And so it was a common practice, it was almost universal, that, you, that employers would provide alcohol. If you were a farmer and you hired farm laborers, those laborers expected that in addition to the pay you were giving them, that you were going to feed them a meal and you were going to provide them with alcohol so they could keep working. If you went into a shoemaker's shop, it would be the same story. The master would provide alcohol. It would be a bond between the master and the journeyman or the apprentice. And it would keep the work going on. Question? Did they also give it to the slaves? No. The slaves are the exception to this, with the exception during harvest season. So it's a special bonus to get slaves to work harder during, say, the cotton harvest or the tobacco harvest by providing them alcohol at that season. But otherwise, masters are trying to deny alcohol to their slaves. But slaves can see the free people all around them drinking very heavily. So it becomes a goal to try to steal alcohol and share it with your friends in the slave quarters as an act of defiance, as a way to say, we're just as good as free people, and we ought to be able to drink too. Now, in the military, the Army and the Navy had to provide alcohol. George Washington's army often ran out of food for long stretches of time. His army never ran out of alcohol. And Washington understood, as did all other commanders, that if you wanted to keep men in the ranks, the number one thing you could do, even better than paying them, was to provide alcohol every day. Same thing in the Navy. Now we're going to see that this is going to start to change during the 1830s and it's going to produce a great deal of strain in social relationships between employers and employees when employers try to cut off the providing of alcohol. Elections promoted alcoholic consumption. We might like to think that people would be sober when they're making their very important political decisions. But in the early republic, most voters were not sober when this happened. And indeed, the friends of different candidates would be at the polling places, and they would have flasks of whiskey with them, and they would be up slapping people on the back and offering them free whiskey and encouraging them to cast their vote for the candidate that was providing them with the alcohol. It was so, for example, a traveler reported, quote, an election in Kentucky lasts three days. And during that period, whiskey and apple toddy flow through our cities and villages like the Euphrates through ancient Babylon. A number of runners, each with a whiskey bottle poking its long neck from his pocket, were busily employed bribing voters. Now today there are laws that say you have to, if you're promoting a candidate, you have to be a certain distance from the polling place and you're not allowed to be pressing alcohol on potential voters. But there were no such laws in the early republic. George Washington was one of the most successful politicians of his time in Virginia because he understood a practice known as treating which is that a candidate should host a barbecue in the run-up to the election 
invite all of the voters of the county to come to his barbecue and provide them with free food, these heaping slabs of smoked and salted meat, and all the alcohol they could drink. Now, the belief of the time was that a candidate that is so generous is proving that he's accessible to common people. He's not some sort of stuck-up, distant aristocrat. And Washington, who was a very dignified man, would not show up at his own barbecue, but he would have friends who would host this, and Washington pays the bill. And he's not alone in doing this. Almost everyone who runs for office in the early republic, particularly in the South, would do this. In one of his more successful campaigns, Washington served 144 gallons of alcohol to 307 voters. That's about two votes per gallon, which was considered not a bad return. But what about the politician who develops principles and decides that he's not going to serve alcohol in a campaign? Well, there was a rare example of this, and his name was James Madison. As a young politician in Virginia, he refused to treat the Virginia voters. He deemed the practice, quote, inconsistent with the purity of moral and Republican principles, end quote. Now, how do you suppose James Madison did in his campaign? He went down to defeat. And the next time he ran for office, he resumed treating the voters, and he won. Okay, so we've explored the reasons behind this very heavy drinking in America of this time. We have to consider what do you suppose the social consequences were of this level of alcohol consumption, particularly by men? What would be some of the problems you would find? Much more domestic violence, uh, particularly of men hitting wives, hitting children. That's a problem. Yes? More violence in general. More, more violence in general. Out there in the taverns, you're surrounded by fellow drunks, you start arguing about politics. You start arguing about the weather. You start arguing about the color of people's eyes. <laughs> and a brawl breaks out. So there is that. Yes? Uh, bad decisions were made. Bad decisions made in terms of? Uh, political? Political decisions. We can sometimes wonder about some of the decisions being made by voters, given the state that they were in, when they go to the polling place. That's why we now have laws saying it's not a good idea to get people drunk just before they go to vote. Other consequences you might think of. Yes? Health problems. Health problems. This is a level of alcohol consumption that can invite health problems. We're not talking about people taking an occasional drink at a meal. We're talking about people drinking all day long hard stuff. Now, not all Americans are doing that, but among American men, a majority of them were doing that in this period of time. And that's going to take a toll on people after a while. For some people, the toll will start pretty quickly, because some people just really don't have the capacity for this, but they feel pressure to do it because that's what everybody around them is doing. Any other problems you can think of? Yes? Bad decisions in the workplace. In the workplace. This is going to become much more of a problem, let's say, when you add machines to the workplace. It's one thing if you're making a shoe by hand, but what if you're making a shoe with the help of machinery and you've had too much to drink? You could start to lose fingers and hands and arms pretty quickly. And employers didn't like that because it messes up the machines. And they spent good money for those machines. What were you going to say? I'm guessing that production also goes down. Like, if you're more drunk, you're not as coordinated. You you're not as coordinated. Money. So once you've got machines, then the level of production is more noticeable to the employer because the job of the employee is to keep pace with the machine. So that's setting a brisker pace than a lot of people were used to working. Now if you're drinking, you can't keep up with the machine then the shoes will come out all screwy because you didn't, as the worker, do your part in the work process. 
So if this is going to be particularly of concern to people who are organizing new workplaces, particularly in factories. Yes. And also the economic slowdown, because because um, the people who is drunk don't work so hard, and then economic That's also. That's right. Employers slowdown. in general want to get more work out of people because they are engaged in a competitive marketplace. So if your competitor manages to reduce the drinking by his workers and you don't, who is it that's going to be more successful in selling the product or producing more product? It's going to be your competitor and not you, and you may go out of business. Yes? Um, military consequences? Because the Navy and the military are drinking so much, they might lose battles because of that. It might be, but the, the good thing for the American military is that the other militaries were also drinking. So the military is going to be the last element of American society to change. And they're going to con be continuing to provide alcohol to the soldiers through the Civil War. Other questions or comments? Yes? Is there a drinking age? No drinking age at that time. So there, you, you, you could come in as a six-year-old, and if you had the money, they would sell you a drink. Okay, well this is good. You've covered the essential elements. Now, as you can think about it, this is this heavy level of drinking that's growing, that's going up, is leading some Americans to question it because of these different social problems. And women in particular, they're not drinking as much as the men, but they are bearing many of the negative consequences. One negative consequence is poverty. If your husband is drinking up his wages, then there's not going to be enough food or decent clothing for the children and for the wife at home. So women are becoming very concerned that a heavy level of alcohol consumption is leading to high levels of domestic abuse, and it is impoverishing many families. And we talked about this concept of Republican motherhood, where women feel they have an obligation to teach virtue to their children. Well, it's pretty hard to teach virtue in a household where the primary male example is drunk a lot of the time. And so women would say, our responsibilities as Republican mothers means that we ought to be heard in the political sphere on issues that affect our household. And the number one negative issue affecting our households is a high level of alcohol consumption. There are really kind of two strands of culture which are coming together. We could say really three strands. One is this idea of Republican motherhood. Another strand is evangelical religion. The United States is primarily a Protestant country at that time, and the most dominant form of the Protestant faith was evangelical. And evangelical churches during this period of time, from 1800 essentially to 1850, have, are increasingly coming to the belief that drinking any alcohol is a sin that leads people to other sins. And so if you are to perfect your moral behavior, then the convert to your faith must stop drinking. Now earlier in the colonial period, churches had, had tried to reduce drinking a little bit, but they hadn't really pushed on it. Now you get churches pushing very hard, especially in the period after 1830. So we've got Republican motherhood is one strand of influence. We've got evangelical churches as another strand. And the third is industrial capitalism. And we talked about how employers were in a more competitive marketplace. They wanted more productivity from their workers. They didn't want to be spending their own money buying drinks for their workers when that is just complicating and reducing productivity. Yes? Um, would you say that uh, this heavy alcohol consumption deepened the divide between women's domestic sphere and public sphere? or connected it? Well, it's, it's deepened it, 
that women are feeling that the public sphere, particularly all this drinking at militia musters or at elections, is causing a problem for them in their households. So they say, if we're going to protect our sphere, this domestic sphere, we need to have a whole lot less drinking in the public sphere. Now, if they succeed in this temperance movement and the public sphere becomes one that's much more temperate, then the argument is that the domestic sphere and the public sphere will be in more harmony than they are when you have this high level of drinking, both public and private. Yes? Um, wouldn't like, decreasing the amount of alcohol in industrial capitalism um, goes against the idea of increasing productivity because that would promote um, things like protests among the workers? Well, it might, but workers like to have their jobs. And this is a time in which the union movement was very weak. So not all employers can get away with this, but most employers can get away with it. Because there are, even where people are unionized, there are other issues that are more important to them, such as having better pay. So sometimes employers are improving pay a little bit at the same time that they're taking away the provision of this alcohol in the workplace. Now I say sometimes. Often the employer is just taking away the alcohol provision and not improving the pay, but workers have to take it because they're not unionized. This is a time in the country when the government, state and national, do not recognize unions. That's a development of the 20th century. Okay, so the workplace is changing. Now again, I want to remind you, most Americans stay farmers. And a lot of farmers are still providing alcohol. So it's not so much that the workplace is changing for farmers, it's that a lot of farmers are becoming evangelical Christians and they want to reduce alcohol consumption because it's, in their conviction, the moral thing to do. Some employers are not only eliminating the alcohol they provide in the workplace, they're also telling their workers, don't you bring your own flask in here. No more drinking on the job. Some employers go even farther where they can get away with it. And they say, you know, if you really want to keep your job here, I'd like you to go to the local evangelical church and I'd like you to take a pledge of temperance and preferably one of abstinence. Now this means of alcohol. Uh, now a lot of workers would just say, no way. But workers who are concerned about keeping their job might say, okay, I'll see you in church on Sunday. So this is developing a tension. Not all workers want to go along with what their employers want them to do in terms of changing their behavior, not simply in the workplace, but also on their leisure time. Some workers go along with it, some don't. It also becomes a class divide. Now which social class do you think is going to be pushing hardest for temperance? Uh, well, yeah, the, the people who will be owning these workshops or owning farms, so what class would we call that? Middle class and wealthier people would be pushing for temperance. And the people who would be most resistant to it would be the people who feel they most need alcohol to cope with their harder lives. And that would be more working people. Now again, I'm just talking about a general pattern. You will find plenty of working men who joined temperance groups because they wanted to get better control of their lives. So no, I don't want you to go away from this thinking that all workers just wanted to get drunk. And that's not true. There were many workers who cared about temperance. But the people who cared most deeply about temperance were middle class people. Any questions so far? Now there's also, so I talked about, there's something of a gender divide. Women care very deeply about temperance. Most of the resistance to it will be male. It's a class divide, much stronger among middle class people than among working class people. There's also an ethnic divide. People who are already born in the United States 
were more prone to embrace the temperance movement than were immigrants. And immigrants often felt that this was a form of cultural warfare. There's also a religious divide. Many of the immigrants to America were Catholics, and uh, they didn't quite see the same problem with alcohol that Protestants were identifying. And they felt that attempts to reduce their alcohol consumption was a way of attacking their ethnicity and their faith. So if you wanted to find the setting where you would find probably the greatest commitment to preserving traditional customs of drinking, it would be in neighborhoods that would have a large number of immigrants, relatively poor, often Catholic. And they would just say, it's none of your business what we do on our own time, leave us alone. There becomes a political divide. By the 1830s and 40s, we've got a new pair of political parties. The old Federalists, gone. The old Jeffersonian Republicans have evolved. And what are the names of the two parties we find during the 1830s and 1840s? Go ahead. The Democrats and the Whigs. Now the Whigs drew very heavily upon those social groups that favored temperance. So the Whig Party made a commitment to pushing temperance because the Whig Party was strong in the Northeast, strong among business owners, strong among evangelical Christians, Although women couldn't vote, if women could vote, they would have voted overwhelmingly in the Northeast for the Whigs. The Democratic Party, on the other hand, draws support from those groups that tend to be most skeptical about temperance. Immigrants, working class Americans, more rural Americans. So there's something of a cultural divide that's emerging in the country that has political consequences. Now the temperance movement does start to have an impact during the 1830s and 1840s. And initially it's in the form of what we call moral suasion. That's like persuasion. Now for example, you, if you're watching television, you will see ads where there are warnings against the consequences of drunk driving. Now, there's certainly laws against drunk driving, but there's also a publicity campaign that's mounted by social groups and by the government to try to persuade people to change their behavior. Similar efforts to try to persuade people today to stop smoking cigarettes. That's what we call moral suasion, an attempt to persuade people to make the choice themselves to change their behavior. And temperance initially focused on moral suasion and achieved some gains. It essentially became disrespectable to be a middle class person and to be a heavy drinker. Middle class people start to police themselves. They don't like to associate with people who are heavy drinkers. And so it starts to dissipate in the middle class, particularly in the Northeast and the Midwest. But persists in the working class where Working class people are reinforcing more traditional behavior. Well, temperance groups are finding that there's kind of a cap to how far they can go in achieving the reduction of drinking if they just rely on moral suasion. So the alternative is to get localities and states to pass laws that would forbid the sale, the consumption, the production of alcohol. Now, you're thinking about the famous prohibition law that Congress passed in the 1920s. We're talking about an earlier period when it is not a federal issue. It's a state issue. And there are a number of states now that take up this question of should they ban the production the sale, and the consumption of alcohol. The first state to do this was the state of Maine in 1851. And so this 
first attempt at prohibition in the country was done at the state level, and the very first state to try it was Maine. Now, Maine's a northeastern state, had a lot of evangelicals, it had a lot of middle-class entrepreneurs, it was very strong for the Whig Party, so it's an ideal place to try this for the first time. But during the next four years, another 12 states will adopt their own version of the Maine law. All of the states were in the north. All of the New England states adopted such laws. New York adopted it, and about half of the states in the Midwest. Did any southern states adopt such a law? No. So we're seeing that the country is dividing over the issue of temperance, and particularly over the attempt to use political prohibition to force people to change their behavior. I have a question. Go ahead. Why does the southern part of the United States not go, n not pass okay, prohibition this is, an, this is a very good question. Can anybody think of reasons why the South might be particularly reluctant to jump on board with this northern phenomenon? Yes? The, with the examples of the factories, there's not as many in the South? So there aren't as many factories. So we talked about industrial capitalism as being one of the three sources, and that source is particularly weak in the South. Yes? A lot of the people in the South work outside, so they They're working work. outside. It's a very rural part of the country. Yes? Pretty rural, so you don't like the town hall meetings that like a lot of the temperance Okay, there, it's harder to organize social groups in the South because the population is so dispersed. Yes? They don't give alcohol to their slaves. They're and not giving alcohol to the slaves, so... So they're drinking them. It's all for themselves, so they think of it as an important right of being a free person is to drink all you want. And do they want outsiders telling them not to? No. no. There's also a developing suspicion about the North and any kind of social movement that develops there. It's perceived to be some sort of dangerous fad and that Northerners shouldn't be telling Southerners want, what to do. So part of it is just trying to defend traditions in the South because they don't want to do anything that's new and comes from the North. And traditions of drinking suits their way of living just fine. Now that's not to say there weren't Southerners who favored temperance. There were. But there weren't enough of them to pass any laws. In general, Southerners do not like an activist government. They don't like governments passing laws making people change their behavior. They just don't like it. They don't like it when their own states do it. And they especially don't like it if any outside government tries to do it. Now, why do you suppose Southerners are so sensitive about an activist government? What kind of activity by a government might be especially concerning to them? Yes? Emancipation of slaves. The slaves. So they don't, they just temperamentally, white Southerners, don't want governments to get it into their head that they can do things like mess with people's property. Now, messing with tavern keepers' property or distillers' property is not as bad as messing with slavery because slavery, so much was invested in that. But still, it's seen as the slippery slope. If a government thinks it has the right to shut down distilleries or shut down taverns, What's to stop them from shutting down slavery? So just to be on the safe side, Southerners, meaning white Southerners, like to say the government that governs best is the government that governs least. And so they didn't like what they were seeing in the North, these Northerners using state governments to try to change people's behavior. Question. Aren't they also still mad over the protective tariffs and how they had to They are. And who is it that's pushing the protective tariffs? The Whigs, the same people pushing temperance. So they just don't trust the messengers who are Whigs. Thanks you very much. I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. 
you can email us at podcasts at c-span.org. Thank you.